So uh, I'm Dan. I'm going to be talking about aggregator, uh, MapReduce, and the type system. So uh, before we kind of dive into that, uh, I need to say a couple words about Stripe. Uh, that's where I work. Um, and that's because we're going to be using that for a lot of examples today. And that'll help motivate some of this work. So Stripe, if you're not familiar, uh, we, we fancy ourselves the easiest way for businesses to accept payments online. This is primarily credit card payments, and we kind of present them with a couple nice integrations. And the idea is that we smooth, smooth over some of the rough edges of kind of dealing with financial integrations and that you shouldn't need to be like a, an expert in payments to start a business online. So I bring this up because, like I said, we're going to be using a lot of examples from kind of the Stripe data domain. So you know, typically the kind of the big units of data in the Stripe ecosystems are things like cards and, and users and customers and transactions. Uh, I might refer to transactions as charges or customers as merchants or something like that. But that, you, get, you get the picture. The kind of lowest level data point is like a transaction or a charge happened. Um, and so data analysis at Stripe in particular kind of has a, a couple of applications. You know, we could be doing, there's a lot of kind of general purpose analytics for kind of informing, you know, what, what features we, uh, you know, are getting use out of, what we aren't, um, you know, any no amount of product development or business analysis. Additionally, a lot of the data analysis that we do goes towards uh, preventing and predicting fraud. Um, so that's what we're going to do today is we're kind of going to work up to using the aggregator on these kind of units of data and show how that gets used as a fraud signal for us. Anyway, on to today's topic. MapReduce and the type system. So what, what do I talk about? What am I talking about when I talk about MapReduce? So I'd like to zoom out a little bit on this point. Uh, I'd say that kind of a lot of forms of data analysis kind of take this general picture, where you're kind of going from raw data. You've got like some crap that happened that you know about, and you want to turn that into statements about properties that you care about. So in this case, we were starting with a bunch of colored squares. And what we are working towards is the statement that like there are four orange yellow squares. There are two green yellow, or yeah, something like that. You see what I'm saying? We're kind of going from just kind of statements that happened to, uh, or rather facts that happened, to statements about properties that we're interested in. And that's kind of like the whole point of data analysis there. You know, you start with facts, you, you wind up with statements. Uh, and you can think of this sort of as reducing the dimension of the data as well. Uh, you know, I, I visually laid it out like that, but you know, you typically kind of talk about data in terms of rows and columns. You have a number of things that happened, and they have a number of attributes, and we're kind of trying to shrink down that space to maybe just kind of like a list of, of quantities that we care about, presumably indexed by some attributes. It's possible that you could want to reduce that even further. You might want to go from this kind of list of the counts of these colors to saying, you know, what, what color occurs the most, you know, what's the average occurrence, stuff like that. In that case, you kind of get down to a single number representing your whole data set. That's like a, a zero dimensional representation of things. And I'd say that this kind of dimensionality reduction can, can pop up in areas where you wouldn't necessarily expect it or what you wouldn't think of as data analysis necessarily. So consider if you're trying to rank comments, you know, assume that our data points in this case are like upvotes and downvotes on comments. And you kind of go through a similar process where you kind of organize things up and you decide you want to kind of come up with some ordering of the comments and, and that amounts to kind of producing some scalar kind of quantified statement about each one. And by the way, as far as this problem goes, there's been like plenty of ink spilled on the right way to, to you know, rank things relative to upvotes and downvotes. I'm sure you can think of several ways to do it. But anyway, back to that first example, this kind of basic thing. So we're going to go from here, which in case it wasn't clear, this is, uh, or in case I didn't say it, this is kind of counting how much each color appears. So I'd like to kind of move us on to the equivalent in the Stripe domain. So let's say we were asking for all of our merchants, how many charges has each one made? And I've just kind of tossed up uh, an implementation uh, in SQL that would more or less work. Um, and so let's step through you know, how, this, how we organize this. Um, you know, we've kind of, we're, we're specifying like that we want to do some grouping and we're specifying kind of how we want to, you know, count up our groups. It's, it's pretty simple. There's not a lot going on there. Um, you know, the one thing I might call out though is that we're not at any point specifying how we want to do this. We're just kind of specifying what we want to happen and it happens. Uh, I think Peter talked to, about stuff like that yesterday. So zooming in in particular, going from this just kind of focus on where we start and what results we want. Um, let's kind of examine like MapReduce specifically. Um, so that kind of, that starts to inform a little bit more the mechanics of how this stuff happens. So now you've kind of laid it out specifically as, okay, MapReduce has these two phases, you know, 
you go from your, your kind of unstructured mess of data points and you group things up based on these attributes that you're interested in and then you have some way of reducing down those groups. And that reduce is you know, meant to be kind of the, the same idea as like the functional programming concept of reduce. You, know, you kind of like have this list and you, you have some way of, of chunking things down. Um, and so the programmer is expected to fill in a couple of blanks here, one of which is you know, given a data point, what group does it belong to? And given a group of data points, how do I reduce those down? Uh, that, that's kind of the API you're given for doing that sort of thing. But you know, again, this is, this is just kind of like a way to accomplish, like I said, was a pretty general goal for us. Uh, and some, you know, just uh, in case people don't uh, have the pleasure of working with this day to day, um, you know, I just kind of want to take a peek at what this API like formally looks like, especially in like the Hadoop context. Um, there's a lot of characters there, a lot of kind of parameterization. I wouldn't focus too much on this other than to point out that the, the API you're given for what I just described, which is breaking things up into groups and reducing them down to groups, kind of amounts to this like, okay, given a data point, emit like a, a KV tuple and given then like in your reduce, given a key and a sequence of data points, you know, emit to more tuples. It's, it's always framed in this like KV pairs that you're sending out and stuff. Okay, so, so let's look at that same computation that we were doing before, this how many charges per merchant, and kind of sketch it out as a MapReduce job. Um, so, you know, let's say your incoming data, you've got your data point, and you're going to extract the merchant, like I said, and you're going to say, okay, well, okay, so there was one here. And then when you reduce things, you've got your, your key is your merchant again, and you're going to be summing your values. So I think it's interesting to reflect on how this differs from the, the SQL that we were doing before. There, there's a couple of things that are happening differently. You know, this, this feels very much more like telling the, telling the program what to do than what you want to happen, uh, if, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, a little bit more imperative here. And it's also kind of, it's very intimately tied to knowing how the platform is going to work. Like if you just looked at this in isolation, it wouldn't be clear what it was going to do. You have to build in this knowledge of what the platform is going to do for you. So speaking of which, what is the kind of MapReduce platform that I'm referring to? Why do people get excited about this? The idea is that those phases that I described before um, are pretty easy to split among multiple machines. So it, it's something that kind of admits itself well to parallelization. Both the kind of, I want to send data points out to groups and I want to reduce groups down. Those are both things you can kind of stick on your emoji computers as you like. Um, so, you know, it kind of decomposes the problem a bit. That's a little bit nice in that there's some amount of heavy lifting of sorting these groups around that the platform does for you. And the idea is that you, the application developer, just need to kind of focus on filling in the blanks there and it can do the rest for you. But the assertion I'm making today is that I don't think is, this is like the decomposition that we as developers really want, or, or at least it's not the one that I want. In particular, this is a decomposition that favors this particular implementation and this particular like execution environment, right? Like this is, you are decomposing it in a way that makes it easy to kind of parallelize and run it at scale or whatever. Um, but it doesn't really kind of optimize for expressing the computations that we want. So that's what we're gonna get to. So what I mean is that kind of in this, in this phase, we typically, you know, we've got our kind of reduce operation where we want to count things up, and we, we somehow kind of bleed our logic into both of these phases where, you know, for any computation that we're trying to do, we've kind of split what we're saying between these two phases. And it makes it kind of hard to build on things, to refactor things or combine them. You know, given this data point, we've now decided that, you know, the only information we care about it is that it's orange and that there was one of it. Um, but when you want to kind of start doing more, um, you know, more powerful things that you need to kind of go back and revise this as your map phase, let's say. So what are the kind of real components that I think we should break this down into? Uh, I think that, you know, this, this kind of general paradigm, like, it, you know, certainly works, but I think that rather than kind of talk about those map and reduce operations, what we probably want to talk about as far as expressing these computations goes is we've got the two phases, which is kind of, well, it's what I've been saying in English, group the data points by you know, the entities of interest. In our case, it's been like the merchant and the stripe domain, or the, or the color and the kind of colored squares. And then given the sequence of data points, reduce them down. So I specifically mean that as opposed to like emit key value pairs. Okay, so at this point, uh, I will say that we are going to kind of take a turn, which is that uh, I am going to talk only about the second point from here on in. Uh, the, kind of, the first point is like, not that interesting to me, it's pretty easy. You know, you get a data point, you kind of assign some key to it, maybe more than one key. Um, 
But I think there's a lot more kind of breadth that we can explore in this second point, this reducing operation. So what am I getting into when I say that there's, there's like a lot of kind of depth in this reduce? So with the counting, that was pretty kind of dead obvious. You know, it was just how do you count things? Um, in this case, though, if you look at this as kind of an example data set, it's not, it's not entirely clear what this is supposed to reduce down to. Um, and that's, you know, kind of representative of the real world. A lot of your data points are multifaceted, and, and you want to do more than just count how many of them there are. So uh, what, what am I trying to say about this? Maybe I want to say how many distinct shapes were there. There's, there's three there. Or maybe I want to ask what the kind of mode appearance of shapes is. There's two. Or maybe I'm not even interested in the shapes specifically. Maybe some of them have these, these kind of outlines, and I want to count those. Uh, so we're going to be exploring stuff like that, where there's, you know, there's a number of ways, given a sequence of data points, that you might want to reduce it down. And that's what aggregator lets you do. So let's hop back to an example in the Stripe domain. Uh, we're going to be sticking with this example for a while, so probably best to get your head around it now. Uh, so let's say I want to say not just how many charges has a merchant had, how many different cards have they seen? This is kind of a proxy for how many customers do they have or whatever. So again, kind of looking at this in SQL, uh, it looks pretty much the same as what we did before, except instead of our, our count star there, we've got this count distinct card now. So I think this is, um, I think this is kind of neat. This kind of reflects what we were saying before in that you know, the grouping phase is still the same, and we've just kind of had to edit our, our you know, reducing our, our combining phase to make this work out. Um, and again, we're not telling SQL how we want to compute this. We're just telling it what we want computed and, and trust that it can figure it out. So, uh, you know, just for contrast, let's look again in my little faux MapReduce how that would look. So notice now that we've kind of, we, you know, we're again extracting the merchant as we were before, but our map phase now, you know, previously we were kind of emitting a one because that was all we cared about. And now we need to know that we need to emit this card. And, and I know that because I know that I'm going to have to kind of get the distinct values later. Um, so I'm kind of doing this thing where, where I've had to, you know, knowing what I need to do in the reduce phase, I've had to go back and change my map phase. And that, you know, if you're kind of working in this, that, that'll be kind of like a, a daily familiarity. And it's really just, it's not that fun to have to kind of jump between those two. So uh, specifically, I, I think we can do better at expressing these computations. Um, and so it's time to introduce aggregator. So aggregator is a Scala trait in Algebird. Algebird is a, uh, is a library that Twitter's released. Um, they, their tagline is Abstract Algebra for Scala. Uh, it's available on GitHub. It's been there for a while. Um, and so the, the idea with aggregator is to use types is to, well, the idea is to express exactly these kinds of computations, these kind of map, reduce, and then map operations. Uh, and we use kind of types along the way to kind of guide how, how these can be composed and how they can be reused. And the idea is that it'll, it's going to express a lot of different things that we might want to do when we're reducing down data, certainly more than SQL can get us. Um, but you know, using these things, it's, it's easy to use them as building blocks. Uh, additionally, it's not so much tied to being executed like as a Hadoop job or whatever. You've kind of, you'll be expressing how to do these computations without necessarily specifying a particular execution platform. And we'll talk about, about why that's important in a bit. OK, so sticking with our previous example, how many cards were there per merchant? Um, I'm going to start getting into like some pseudo Scala syntax here. Uh, so you know, the, the, typical sh the general shape of this is that we have a, a sequence of charges that have happened. And at the end, we want to get out an answer that's like an integer, how many different cards were there among those charges. So again, this is kind of just that reduce phase. So if you recall how we did this, though, we, we're not actually really just kind of hopping from the charges to the integer. Along the way, we had this thing that we had to accumulate. And so I want to introduce the, what I'll be calling a computation type from here on in, which is that in between, there's this kind of running total that we need to maintain. And in our case, it's, it's going to be a set of cards. Um, and you know, in some computations, you don't really need to think about that. If you're just counting things, then you're, you, know, you accumulate a count along the way. And then at the end, that's your answer. Uh, in this case, for many computations, you've got something that you want to accumulate along the way before presenting an answer. And, and yes, I know that's not Scala syntax for much of anything. Um, so you know, let's, let's look at an example here that's kind of using this sort of computation type just in a, in a pure Scala collections way. And then we'll, we'll kind of get to the real stuff after that. So if I've got this kind of, if I've got this list here, as I was saying before, if I'm just counting things, 
then I can just kind of, you know, take every, every item that I'm interested in and say, okay, that's a one, and I'll add them up. And that's my answer right there. I've, I've been kind of using this reduce structure with ha which has this accumulator thing, but that's just my answer. Whereas if I want to get, you know, distinct elements, well, I've got this set accumulator that I create here, but then notice at the end that to get the answer I want, I need to call this dot size at, at the end. So there's a, a bit of a distinction there. So let's look at how aggregator treats this. So an aggregator is a, it's this trait, and it's got three type parameters. So um, for those who, who don't kind of work with Scala all the time, the idea is that you can kind of, you can put together one of these structures, be it a, a class or a trait or whatever, um, that kind of uh, operates on some, some things of other types, and you can implement it while being somewhat generic to those other types. I recognize if you're a Golang programmer, this might be slightly mind-blowing, but bear with me. Um, so aggregator kind of will have these three types. There's, uh, there's, the, there's this A type, which is the input type. There's the B type, which is that computation that we were describing. And the C type is going to be the output. And so uh, these traits, traits are kind of like somewhere between an abstract class and an interface in Java. They'll, uh, they'll omit some things from being implemented and then give you some other things for free. So in this case, the few things that we want to implement are uh, we've got a prepare operation which given our input type will kind of get us, call it like a singleton member of the computation type, something like that. We just need to go from like the input to what it is that we want to add up. We're going to have this reduce method, and I'm actually kind of taking a shortcut from the, from the real API here, but we'll refer to the reduce method that's going to take two members of the computation type and combine them. As an aside, if you're into this sort of thing, the reduce, you want that to be associative, or you need that to be associative for it to do much of any good, uh, but we won't really delve into that. And then present is going to say, okay, given, uh, given you know, a computation that we've had running, what's the answer that we want out of that? So that's kind of a, a lot of words. You know, we'll, we can visually look at it like this, and maybe this doesn't do you much good, but we're going to build on this diagram. So you, know, you kind of take A in, and you add up these elements of B, and you eventually get C out. So let's return to our example and see how we would kind of implement those three methods in the case we were describing before. So let's say we wanted to do like a merchant card count. Again, this is the, you know, set of distinct cards that appear with a merchant. So notice I've filled in what those, what those A, B, and C types are here. Our input is going to be the charge. Uh, notice it's like a single charge. The input is just the, the type of one data point. Uh, the computation type is going to be a set of cards. You know, as we were saying, that's what we need to accumulate. And the output, and I wrote long, but you know, some quantity. Uh, and these are pretty simple. You know, you kind of you make the singleton set, like I said, as your prepare. That's us going from our input type to something that we want to add up. You've got your reduce is just kind of the union of two sets, and your present is the size, just as we were describing before. So, um, you know, it, it might be worth taking a second to reflect and compare this to, you know, the other ways, you know, there's like a couple of other ways that we've already implemented the same computation. Um, notice how we're, we're decomposing it into these pieces, but... Uh, we're not really making any assumptions about how that, well, we're, they we're not terribly tied to a particular execution platform here. We've kind of described everything that needs to be done, but not quite how it fits together. Um, it's also somewhere, I would say, sitting between the kind of uh, MapReduce and SQL forms in that uh, we're describing what needs to be done. We're kind of, we're certainly saying it in code, but we're not really saying when or in what order. So I don't know, it's just kind of an observation. Um, so at this point, you're looking at this, and this is uh, definitely the most verbose way to describe that computation so far, and uh, you may well be unconvinced that this is going to do you any good. Um, so let's kind of explore what more we can do with aggregators. So in particular, I'd like to talk about how you can compose them, uh, how you can kind of reuse them that way, and the standard library of aggregators that you can draw from. Uh, then I'm going to talk about kind of different you know, patterns for executing them, whether it's uh, in the MapReduce context or, or elsewhere. And finally, I'm going to kind of talk about it in an example of fraud prevention at Stripe. And uh, in the course of this, I will eventually get to why I keep going on about separating the kind of definition of this job from how it's executed. So when I talk about leveraging the standard library, like I said, that previous uh, example was you know, kind of ridiculously verbose. Um, and it turns out that you know, if you kind of zoom in at, at this kind of computation type as sort of the, the core part of the aggregator, there's not that many of these computations that we're typically interested in. There's like a lot of pretty common ways that we want to roll these things up when you kind of like get down to the very core of it. 
Um, and a lot of these kind of come bundled for us. And so we don't, you know, we can kind of uh, just draw on them right away. So if we want to kind of take the unique count of elements, then that's, um, you know, that's pretty easy. That's right there. If we want the size of elements, the median, whatever, things like that. Um, and so what's nice there is that, you know, because we've got this kind of relatively fixed set of things that we're probably interested in, you know, a lot of these have been implemented for us already. And because we've kind of decomposed that, you know, we've kind of separated out this computation type from your inputs and your desired outputs, you can do that without knowledge of, of you know, my application that I want to do for Stripe or what somebody at Twitter wants to do. We can kind of share the underlying computation. Um, so, you know, I'll just point out that if we do this structure here, uh, I've kind of given you our, our three types that that leaves us with. You know, we're going to be inputting a card notice, not a charge. And we'll again be kind of aggregating a set of cards and be left with, with an integer at the answer. So okay, we haven't quite gotten to, to kind of you know, re-implementing our example yet because our, our input type is different. So aggregator gives you something to work with that. Uh, so we've got this, uh, this function called compose prepare. So this is available on all aggregators. If you have an instance of an aggregator, that's what, you know, unique count is an instance of one of them, you can call compose prepare with another function and get a new aggregator that's got that prepare operation stuck on the front. So in this case, this is telling us how to get from a charge to a card. And we kind of just run that prepare before any other aggregator operations. And now we're left with the type signature that we want. So. Uh, I've got a, a little diagram kind of referring back to our previous visual language. You know, we, we started with this thing that took a card and aggregated a, a set of cards. And you can think of compose prepare as um, kind of sticking this thing around it, where you now have charges your input, but it, it's still using the other aggregator under the hood. And at the end, you're left with another aggregator. So that's kind of nice. This, this is what helps you kind of take these pre-built aggregators that exist and map them to, you know, your domain. So has anybody else been, uh, been kind of, has anything been nagging anybody about this example so far? You know, like if you're doing this kind of computation where you want to maintain these sets, you know, along the way, if you're doing this in like a Hadoop context or something, uh, and, you, and you do this in your day job, you've likely encountered a case where that set is going to kind of grow in memory to a point where, where that starts to be untenable for some of your larger customers. So, what people will sometimes do in this case is say, okay, you know, beyond a certain point, I don't care about the exact answer. Uh, and there's, there's, you know, out there in the world, there's these approximate data structures that allow you to get kind of an estimation of the answer in a fixed space of memory. So I won't get into it too much, but Algebra has a lot of those implemented. And what's nice here is that we can very quickly swap that out. So this is, you know, this is where you're starting to really see the benefits here is that um, we kind of had this this general way of computing set sizes, and now we can kind of swap in for it uh, something that computes set sizes in a kind of approximate way using a fixed memory footprint. Uh, and that, that one that I'm actually quoting there will kind of give you the exact answer up until some minimum size and then drop down to the approximate thing. It's pretty much just what you want. Um, so yeah, that's really nice. You know, that's where you start to really reap the benefits here is that Algebra has like a wealth of these kind of approximate or otherwise kind of difficult computations that you can make use of. So here's a list of some of them. I won't go into too much detail, but this is just kind of a, a feel of some of the things that it offers for you. So uh, now let's kind of talk about different ways that you can kind of actually use these. You'll note that I've yet to call any of these methods, really. Um, so how, you know, how does one actually put this to use? So first off, the kind of simplest way is that any of these aggregators has an apply method, which will just take a sequence of inputs and give you the answer at the end. And that's just kind of doing your, your, all your computation in one fell swoop. Um, and that can be pretty useful. So as an example, just to show us that we can kind of get back to where we started at least, uh, here's kind of a, a MapReduce like fully Hadoop style thing implemented with aggregator. So remember, I've got that key function that I told you I don't care about. Uh, and then our reduce phase just becomes applying the aggregator to our values. Uh, so we won't dwell on this too much, but that's kind of the simplest way that you could execute one of these. Uh, if you've kind of rolled up all your computation in there. Um, so there's other ways that you can do it, though. In particular, you can imagine kind of as you take in data points, uh, at, each, you know, at each data point that you get, you continue to update your running total. And you can ask for the answer at any point along the way there. Um, and so that's really nice if you're kind of looking at it in more of a streaming context, which we'll do in just a second. 
Um, and you know, this sort of thing is trivial if you're just kind of doing raw counters. But uh, when you start to do stuff like set sizes and whatnot, um, it, you know, it really helps to kind of expose what that sort of underlying computational type is. Um, and that's very natural with aggregators. So uh, having seen this stuff, uh, I'd like to move us on to talking about uh, fraud prevention at Stripe. So in particular, we're going to talk about a problem that we call merchant fraud. So this is, um, this is a space where we're trying to classify the case where merchants themselves are bad actors. So somebody could they'll sign up and they'll kind of run a bunch of stolen credit cards against us. It's, uh, not, not terribly exciting, uh, but totally insidious. Um, and so we can, we can try to detect this activity by uh, looking at what they're doing when they kind of make an account with us and looking at the charges made on their account. So, uh, you know, to kind of glance through how, how this is going to wind up working, we're going to have like a predictive model and just as a kind of, you know, crash course and that sort of thing. The way this will generally work is that we're going to we're going to you know, come up with some features. These are attributes of, of the merchant that we're interested in. And we're going to combine them by assigning weights to them and summing them up, let's say. That's just one way to do it. If you're really in the aggregator mindset, you'd notice that combining these features could probably be expressed as an aggregator as well. But we won't really go there. Uh, so let's talk about what these features could be. Uh, there's a couple of kinds of features that we typically refer to when we work on this stuff at Stripe. We talk about static features, which are like, uh, where was the merchant when they signed up for this account, or what time of day was it? And that stuff's pretty easy. You just store it once, you look it up. We also have these things that we call dynamic features, and these are kind of uh, based on historical kind of measurements that we've taken. So like for a merchant, what's their average charge amount, or how many cards have they worked with, stuff like that. Uh, that class of thing winds up being a lot more helpful for us. I guess it's just harder for merchants to, for uh, fraudsters to fake or whatnot. Um, but so uh, yeah, you know, additionally, they're a little bit harder to compute. So most of these kind of have the shape of those aggregates that we've been describing earlier, and that we've kind of reduced down some past activity to some statement about what the merchant has been up to. Okay, so so that's all well and good. And remember, as I was saying before, when we want to make a prediction, we want to kind of get all these features available and combine them. So that means that for these kinds of computations, we want to have those available to us at prediction time. So let's talk about what it would look like to assemble one of these features. This is a real one. Um, so let's say that we're interested in the number of international cards that, that a merchant has used. So I'm, I'm going to like kind of not get into that top one, but let's just say that given a charge, we can kind of optionally you know, come up with the card that was used if it was international. Um, so we can pretty quickly hop using what we've done before, and there's some kind of magic in here to make it work with options. Um, and we can kind of hop into saying, okay, well this is going to be, you know, given a merchant's charges, uh, this is kind of the number of international cards that they've used. And that, that's pretty you know, easy to do once we've got this set size stuff uh, at our disposal. But you know, we may look at that and evaluate it and decide that what we actually wanted wasn't just the total number, but, but that number as a fraction of all the cards they've seen. Because you know, this might work differently on different size merchants. So it turns out we can do that rather easily as well. Um, so I want to highlight this from two method. So this is an interesting thing that aggregators get you. It's a little bit like that compose prepare that I showed you. If you have two aggregators that have the same input type, you can produce a new aggregator that does both of the computations and gives you both of the answers. So uh, their computation types are, you know, they can be separate. Their output types can be separate. So let's, let's look at that in our visual language again. Now, just in this case, it, it happens to be that they're kind of both the exact same type. Uh, but you know, really what we want to focus on is having the same input type. And you can imagine this kind of from to, this joining, as putting a structure like this around it, where you now kind of have your input as just the charge, and it's going to go through both of these computations. And that's still a single aggregator. So that, you know, that gets us, you know, we're doing okay. Remember our example is that we've kind of got the international cards and the total cards that we're computing. But we don't kind of want those two integers as an answer. We want the ratio. So aggregator lets us do that as well. We have this and then present method, which you, know, you tack on somewhat like compose prepare. Give it an aggregator. You kind of give it another function that's like an extra presentation step. Uh, and this, as you can see, especially comes in handy when you've kind of got multiple aggregators going on, where you have some 
something that you know you want to do with two of them. So in this case, we've now noticed that we've kind of changed our output type to a double, so we're taking the ratio there. And so again, visually, uh, let's see if we can have a look at this. For whatever reason, these diagrams are like making my computer like go into a panic attack. Uh, but anyway, here we go. We've got uh, one of these things. And if you imagine laying on Compose Prepare, um, this is just going to be us putting on this extra step. But again, at all stages here, we still have an aggregator. Each time we call one of these Compose Presents, or Compose Prepare, and then Present, stuff like that, still aggregators all the way down. And that's important because we can continue doing this. We can continue building this up. You know, that was just one feature that I showed you. We had that ratio of international cards. But you can imagine that we might want to do the same thing for prepaid cards. We can build up that aggregator the same way and compose the two of them. And in this way, we have one aggregator that's now uh, computing both of these features. And what's really nice there is that we can just kind of throw that into one job and let that all run. Uh, if you're trying to do this with kind of your MapReduce jobs and your Map and your Reduce phase, it can become quite a pain to kind of make them all work at the same time. And then I've kind of tacked on that maybe you'll want to kind of present it as JSON, depending on who's using it. Um, you know, all that stuff is pretty easy. Um, and, and you know, that, that is how we ex express these features, by the way. So uh, that's all well and good. Uh, our problem here, though, is that typically when you'd want to run, run something like this, you kind of want to roll up all this activity. Uh, and you might do it in a nightly batch job. And for us, unfortunately, our kind of uh, our assailants don't really cooperate with that uh, execution schedule. Um, and you know, we need to be able to kind of have these computations ready faster because we, we need to make these determinations much more frequently. And like I said, when we want to make these predictions, uh, what we have to do is have all of these feature computations ready. So uh, let's see what we can do there. So at this point, what we start using is Twitter's summing bird package. Uh, so maybe familiar to some of you. Um, but what this allows you to do is run MapReduce-like code. You, you kind of write your application code once, and it's able to formulate that as either a storm topology for kind of a real-time streaming effect or a Hadoop job. It also gives you the facilities to take the outputs of both of those and combine them into one answer. Um, and this is a very nice fit with Algebra and Aggregator, where it lets you do this sort of thing with these very complex uh, calculations. You know, people have been doing hybrid batch systems for quite a while, but you typically rely on some properties of your database or something to kind of have results that you can recombine. Uh, this lets us kind of push that into the application layer where we can do these more powerful computations. So let's, uh, let's look at how this looks. Um, so, you know, we're hopping back to our aggregator types here again. You can imagine we have a sort of input that's a sequence of data points of our type A, our input type. And then we fork that off, we send it to our real-time layer, and we send it to our batch layer, and they're both going to run their computations. And what they're going to do is they're going to kind of do that prepare, and they're going to kind of reduce things down, and they'll be storing their computation type in their respective databases. Finally, when a query comes in, we, uh, we query for both the real-time results and the batch results. And since we know how to combine results by our reduce operation, we can merge those together and then present it as our output type, C. So from the outside, all we see is that we have the input type that we want and the output type that we want. But in order to be able to recombine these and do these incremental, or, yeah, these incremental computations, it's pretty necessary that we've elevated that computation type to a first-class citizen and know how to operate with that. And that's, you know, that's one of the great things that Aggregator buys you. Uh, and so you know, this, this general shape, this is how we, uh, we kind of have this fraud application running, uh, where we've got all of our features available in real time. In case it's not clear, the idea is that we're pre-computing all the feature values, and then we can query for them whenever we want. So uh, that's, um, that's, that's basically what I have here. Um, so as a recap, uh, you know, we've kind of we started by talking about kind of reduction in MapReduce as being kind of at the heart of a lot of data analysis problems. That a lot of a lot of problems that we're trying to do with large data sets are to reduce the dimension somehow. Then we went through how Aggregator will kind of define that reduction, you know, within its types uh, and how it lets you, you know, express that pretty uh, pretty flexibly. How you can compose and decompose aggregators to reuse them well. Uh, notice that a lot of that stuff that we described before is made possible by you controlling when you call each different phase. 
Uh, and finally, we talked about how it being kind of independent from an execution platform allows you to do flexible deployments like this kind of batch hybrid thing. So um, like I said, that is very much how we think about these computations. And uh, I will be more earnest than I usually am with this sort of thing. Like this is frankly a pretty fun way to express these kinds of aggregates. So if you want to prevent criminals from stealing money by doing magic with math and computers, then um, you, know, you should give us a look. And it uh, looks like I've got a few minutes for questions, but uh, thanks very much.